to our final CHURD webinar of 2022. Today you join us from various treaty and unceded territories on which you all have the privilege to work and live. I join you from CHUR, the Center for Higher Education at University of Manitoba, which where the campuses are located on the original land of this Anishinaabe Cree, Oji Cree, Dakota, Dedi peoples, and on the homeland of the Manitoba Métis Nation. We respect the treaties that were made on these territories. We acknowledge the harms and mistakes of the past, and we dedicate ourselves to move forward in partnership with Indigenous communities in a spirit of reconciliation and collaboration. Today, we're joined by Cheryl Foy, President of Strategic Governance Consulting Services and author of the recently published book, An Introduction to University Governance. Beginning her career as a union side labor lawyer, Cheryl has over 20 years of governing experiences in multi sectors, public, private, culminating in her recent experience in university governance. Today, she tackles a challenging topic university governance and labor relations. Ne'er the twain shall meet. Or, so welcome. Cheryl, and I'll turn it over to you. And just a couple of, of uh, housekeeping functions. If you've got questions, please, I'll ask you to put them in the Q&A. If you've got comments, please put them in the chat so that this way we can try our very best to cover all the questions as we uh, finish the presentation. Thank you. Thank you, and thanks, Kathleen. Um, I wanted to welcome everyone. As I said in the chat, it's great to see some familiar uh, names in uh, in the attendee list. And we do have really high, uh, good registration today. Um, so I'm really pleased about that. I appreciate uh, the interest in the topic and I appreciate your time. I know it's a busy time of year to be joining a webinar, but uh, I'm glad that you think this is an important topic. I certainly do. In terms of, um, I'd also like to thank Kathleen and I'd like to thank Churd for hosting this webinar and for their support for the work that I've been doing. Um, in terms of our time today, we've, we've had our introductions and our lands acknowledgement. I'll take about 50 minutes. We're going to try and actually wrap it up um, a bit early because we, uh, we know there are lots of things going on. But I'm trying to do my presentation within about 50 minutes, allow some time for questions and then, and then some wrap up. So... So let's jump in. In the in the advertisement for this webinar, we said that I'd be tackling these three questions, and I'll be tackling these plus plus some. But the questions we're looking at today are: How do university uh, governance and labor relations or faculty affairs intersect? What's the role of university boards in approving mandates and collective agreements? And how do collective agreements potentially complicate university governance? Um, so in terms of my introductory remarks, and, and Kathleen alluded to this when she introduced me, many of you know me as having an interest in and an expertise in, in governance generally, and in university governance particularly. Um, and as Kathleen said, I've, I've had governance experience in various sectors since 2001. Um, but may, what you may not know about me is that I was born in Northern England, born in Liverpool, England, and came from a working class background. I grew up with an interest in labor. My dad was a staunch union member for many years. And then at some point in his career, uh, joined management side. And so I watched his career in the automotive sector with great interest. I remember the, the miners strike, uh, the Welsh miners strike back in the 80s. Um, and and so when I decided to go to law school, my I decided I wanted to be a union side labor lawyer. And um, and so that's what I did for the first little while. And, and interestingly, my first role as a lawyer was with a firm called Nelligan Power in Ottawa. And um, Peter Barnacle, who is the recently retired general counsel from the Canadian Association of University Teachers, was a colleague of mine um, in that firm. So it's a small world. Um, and although I've when I moved into the general counsel role, it was technically a move to management side. I've always been very involved in labor relations and very committed to positive employee and labor relations. And um, the reason I say all this is, as Kathleen mentioned, this is a this conversation that we're having today is controversial. I've written a blog recently um, about this, uh, about an aspect of this topic, and and I acknowledge that it's controversial. And I think that 
today I'm going to say some things that um, folks certainly who are on uh, in unions may not appreciate, may not like, um, and you know may dismiss them as coming from a place of of anti-union uh, sentiment. And so I want to say up front that that's not at all true. Um, I have a great appreciation for the balance between um, between union protections and and employers and for for unions themselves and the role that they've played in our society. I do believe, however, that to support effective university governance, we need to make senates more robust and more influential as governance bodies. And I think in order to do that, faculty members, individual faculty members, need to participate in university governance as academic professionals and not through the medium or lens of unionism, um, of their unions. And, and I, while faculty unions are very important stakeholders, I think their participation in, in governance muddies the waters. And so what, where I think we should be going is that we should be striving for, um, as a sector, a separation between faculty members' role in the governance of their institutions and faculty unions' role in negotiating and protecting the terms and, and conditions of faculty employment. So that's where I'm coming from today. Um, I thought I'd start by just talking briefly about governance. I acknowledge that uh, not all of the participants in the webinar today will be uh, familiar with university governance and with governance generally. So we'll just start with a just a quick definition. And I've taken this definition from the uh, ISO 37000 standard that was published in September of 2021, which says that governance is a human-based system by which an organization is directed, overseen, and held accountable for achieving its defined purpose. And another way that I've described that in the past is that um, I see governance as the whole system of the delegation of authority inside universities. We typically have a charter or a piece of legislation that creates our university and authority is delegated from that uh, document down through bylaws, policies, terms of reference. And the accountability piece is that that what should be coming back up through the system is an accountability for the exercise of that delegation of authority. And so all of those individuals who are involved in either exercising authority within the system um, and then reporting on that accountability are part of university governance system. Um, I'm going to talk briefly too about what bicameralism is. So universities have a uh, what is called a shared governance environment. It's one of the it's one of the things that makes university governance interesting and unique and more challenging. And within shared that shared governance environment, um, we have different models of governance. The idea behind shared governance is that we have, and this is very very simpli uh, simplified, but is that we have a a board, either a board of trustees, a board of regents, a board of governors, that is responsible for the quote business side of things, so the strategic um, plan, oversight and compliance, financial sustainability. Um, the property and buildings uh, for the university, so that the business element of it, and that that body acting in the public interest shares shares its responsibility with faculty members who participate in the academic governance of the institution. They bring their professional expertise as educators and researchers, and they support the academic governance of the institution. So that's shared governance. It's shared between this public interest board and faculty members. And bicameral is one, one bicameral governance is one form of implementation of that. So bicameral obviously meaning two, cameral meaning uh, chamber, so two chambers, and the two chambers are typically called the board and the Senate, although we see other names for, uh, for Senate. Um, we also see shared governance implemented as unicameralism, and then we see that at, uh, for example, at uh, University of Toronto, and we also have examples in Canada of tricameralism, but bicameralism is by far the dominant model. So what's the difference then between governance and collective bargaining? And, and um, this is a quotation taken from Julia Eastman and Glenn Jones' uh, recent book, um, University Governance in Canada, Navigating Complexity, which I recommend to all of you. And they 
underscore for us that the two processes, the governance process and the collective bargaining process are very different, that governance concerns the, the means by which order is created in the academy to achieve the goals of educating research and providing service to the multiple publics, so that acting in the interests of the public. And collective bargaining is the process whereby an employer and a trade union seek to negotiate a collective agreement. I think we all have intuitively understand this. And that collective agreement is a document that records the terms and conditions of employment, the rights of the duty and duties of the employer and employees in a bargaining unit. So from a, from a governance perspective, why did we call this uh, governance and labor relations never the twain or ne'er the twain? And effectively it's because as I uh, alluded to earlier, I think the two processes should be separate from a governance perspective, that's a better way of approaching it. Um, Glenn Jones or Ian Austin and Glenn Jones have written a book um, called Governance of Higher Education and they address the impact of unionization in, in the university sector. Um, and they acknowledge that there are positive and negative views about unionization. And what they say is it's the critical thing about, about it is that is the way that unionization works with traditional internal uh, governance systems, such as the faculty senate. And what they say is what's required, and I really like this, and this is why I've reproduced this here, is a symbiotic dual track approach. And, and what they mean by that is that where traditional labor issues, wages, benefits, um, working conditions are the purview of the union, while the Senate retains control over academic issues. They acknowledge that this is a particularly challenging balance to achieve, um, that there is a tendency for uh, Senates to uh, their role to be dim diminished when unions encroach on the on the role of Senate. And so at the end, they say, thus governing becomes a delicate balance between the traditional collegial faculty governance and the faculty union. So why do I, why does this symbiotic dual track work? Why do I think it works? I think, I think, and we'll talk, I'll talk more about this, but I think it's a way to reconcile the two roles that faculty want to play inside a university being involved both in governing the university and having the protection of being unionized employees. I think it allows faculty to participate on Senate as professionals, as experts in academic matters, not as union members. It avoids the diminishment of the role of Senate and the encroachment of faculty um, unions into the work of Senate. And I think just overall provides a role clarity within governance that is helpful to an effective governance structure. I know that um, not everybody agrees with me. And so the next question I'm asking is, so why isn't this, this dual track separation and agree, agreed and clear approach. Why don't we have consensus that this is the way to approach it in the university sector? And I think there are four reasons that I, I can see for this. One is our history, and I'm going to talk a little bit about each of these, our history. The fact that the Canadian Association of University Teachers, CAUT, has had a very active um, faculty union voice. It has demonstrated thought leadership, advancing the role of faculty associations in governance. And the university sector in, a, in opposition to that has had more of a passive voice and there's been a lack of thought leadership and a lack of focus on role clarity within the governance structure. The last thing I would say, and, and a lot of this is, is um, really from my own uh, observations, I think we've had insufficient governance and oversight and awareness and insufficient understanding of the relationship between governance and, and collective um, agreements. So, Turning to that first, um, the first uh, issue that I mentioned, which is history. Um, it's a long history. And if we, if we look back to 1950, we can, we have a sense of why this track isn't clear. There's a, there's a muddled history to this. So the drive for faculty part, uh, participation in governance started in earnest in the 1950s. And I will note that a lot of this history I'm taking from David uh, Cameron's book, um, more, I have it right beside me here, more than an academic question. And um, so he says that CAUT was formed in 1951. It was formed of um, faculty associations, not certified unions at the time. And um, in the 1950s, only one 
un, uh, university in Canada had a board uh, university uh, academic staff as a board member, and that was Saint uh, Saint FX Saint Francis Xavier. Um, when CAUT was formed, it had uh, University of Alberta, Laval, McGill, Queens, Saskatchewan, U of T, and UBC, and then by about six years later, an additional eight or so um, universities joined CAUT. In 1957, you see CAUT coming out in favor of this drive for faculty participation in governance and governance in saying in a CAUT bulletin, the Canadian university teacher believes our universities would be better run if their teaching staffs were able to create a more or play, play a more creative role in their government. Then you see 1960 CAUT forms a committee on university government and prepares a report to its own executive recommending transferring um, the board's powers to the Senate or academics or to the Senate or recommending that the academic staff should make up the majority of the board. The executive of the CAUT at the time did not um, didn't accept these recommendations, but they did endorse greater faculty participation in university governance. In the mid-1960s, we see Queen's professor George Wally uh, publishing a book called A Place of Liberty. It was a collection of essays that was a plea for reform in governance with a focus on faculty participation in, in university governance. And then, um, you know, during this time, CAUT had been calling for a study of university governance. And by, I think, about 1962, you see that um, AUCC and CAUT have agreed to jointly sponsor a commission on university governance. And this is one that any one of us involved in university governance has heard about. It was the Duff Bertle Commission. Um, and so Duff Bertle began their work in 1964. They delivered their report in 1966. And I've outlined some of the key elements of the report there. They agreed that the system needed reform. They strongly endorsed bicameralism as the appropriate model. They rejected uh, the idea of faculty self-government. They said it failed on two counts. They said not only was it incapable of reforming itself, and they pointed to Oxford and Cambridge as examples of that, but they also said that it was incapable of acting in the public interest. They also rejected direct state control, and they rejected the model of bicameralism. On senates, they said that even back then, they said senates were ineffective. They proposed reforms. They said that senates should be reduced in size to less than 50. They should have specific mandates around academic planning, and they should have a mandate to advise the board. They cautioned against senate, or the role of senate being usurped by faculty associations, called for more democratic and, and responsible management structure, and they called for the board to be more re widely representative and to include faculty members elected by and from this newly reformed senate. And the Duff Bertel report is widely recognized as having transformed university governance in Canada. And although it didn't recommend that students be involved in governance through the, the reforms that took place after Duff Bertel, students inserted themselves into that process and also became involved in, in governance. And by what we see is by 1975, 58 out of 63 universities had faculty members on their boards and 49 of 63 had student members on their boards. So let's also look at the history of faculty unionization. And it, it, this is, again, the reason I'm talking about this is I think it informs what's happening today. There's a history um, within the academy of resistance to unionization because it was at odds with the ideal of faculty self-government. And this debate continued into, the, into 1968 uh, in, sorry, into the 70s. We see in 1968, uh, the CAUT bulletin contained an, art, an article expressing views against unionization, saying that it would change the uni university atmosphere from that of a community of scholars to that of a factory. Um, and then we have a study commissioned by the AUCC, the predecessor to Universities Canada in 1971 from Bernie Adele and Don Carter at Queen's. They're both former professors of mine. Um, uh, and they were looking at the causes and effects of faculty unionization. They found that there were several contributing causes. Um, and one of the consequences that they foresaw was its inevitable conflict in faculty roles resulting from the juxtaposition of faculty bar of collective bargaining and then participatory management. So going back to David Cameron, David Cameron says in the 70s that um, in addition to the transformation of universities into public corporations, one of the key contributing factors to unionization was that post-Duff Birdall, um, 
faculty members were still not seeing the um, the level of participation or the strength of their voice in um, in university governance. And so the quote there is the harsh lesson seemed to be that the keys to the treasury were not after all to be found in the boardroom of the university. So by 1974, five universities had certified faculty unions as opposed to associations. By 1980, you saw 22. Um, by 1990, 29, and today, most universities, I think there are only a few that don't have certified faculty unions. And um, the sector is the most heavily unionized in Canada. So what history tells us is that Canadian um, faculty have long pushed for an increased role in university governance, but haven't achieved the voice or influence they have sought. It tells us that the debate, I think, over unionization um, was never resolved, and I think this is significant to, to today. When Bernie Adele and Don Carter did their study, they pointed to a logical inconsistency between what they call the faculty desire to participate in the running of their universities and the right to confront as adversaries the people who set the terms and conditions of their employment. And I think what we see is that this logical inconsistency continues today and it's something that str we struggle with. It's, it's ill-fitting and it, it causes us complications uh, with respect to governance. So why else don't we see alignment around this idea that there, there sh we should take this symbiotic dual track approach? I think um, another reason is that CAUT sees a strong role for faculty associations in university governance. Um, CAUT has for a long time played an active and important role and has pursued what uh, David Cameron calls a, an aggressive strategy to advance its agenda with a focus on support of local associations, extensive policy work, and the develop, de development of model clauses for use by its, uh, its faculty associations with extensive uh, commentary. And it, these quotations illustrate CAUT's view that there is a strong role for faculty in, in protecting and advocating for faculty's role in governance for faculty associations. Now, some have noted that, um, that unions step in where there's a void. And so if we go back to the roots of faculty activism in the 50s, we go back to the idea that, that uh, it was about ensuring a strong faculty voice. We go back to Duff Birdall. Um, their ob observation then was that senates weren't effective. We can see that CAUT isn't alone in observing that the second houses in our bicameral systems are less than effective. So from a faculty perspective, having, having faculty on boards has been insufficient. Senates are providing an insufficient, uh, insufficiently strong voice for faculty in un, union, university governance. We know that for bicameralism to work, Senates have to be strong and effective. So in the absence of, of all of that happening, CAUT has seen a role for itself and has stepped in. And I think this is entirely understandable, but I think what's missing is a university response on whether or not um, unions are assume, assuming all or part of the role of, of senates is effective governance or whether it's even governance at all. Uh, at some point, if senates become the voice of the union, they simply become another forum for collective bargaining and they become an even if less effective governance body. A Senate that is a voice for, for um, union matters is a voice for faculty, but is it the voice that faculty want on academic matters? Um, as Julia Eastman and Glenn Jones et al. note, when unions expand collective bargaining to encompass matters that might be considered elements of academic self-governance, the result is to emphasize the employee role. So remember this dual track there of employee versus someone who participates in governance and to reduce both the authority of academic self-governance and the professional autonomy of the professoriate. And I would say this is a result that benefits neither unions or the or university governance systems. So what do faculty members think? And I see, I think that when we look at the work done by Lee Pennock et al, um, we can see that we can still see that ambivalence or that tension, um, that, that concern about the role of, of unions, um, or at least a, a failure to fully embrace the role of unions in governance. Um, 
as you'll see from the quote, their survey uncovered no evidence of widespread agreement with the CAUT position among Senate. And what they're what they're specifically talking to, and I'll just jump back, is that quotation, the third quotation there on the last slide, which is our task force has concluded we must finally recognize that university senates have not pr proven to be reliable and consistent vehicles through which academic staff can ensure their proper role in the academic governance of their institutions. We believe that academic staff associations must turn to collective bargaining to ensure their position in academic decision making. And so in reaction to that, um, Penicatal say there's they don't see widespread agreement with that. In fact, there's ambivalence that 40 percent, 41 percent disagreed with the statement that the role of our Senate has been strengthened by the work of faculty association and union. 30 percent were neutral and only 28 percent agreed. And if you go down to the to the end of this paragraph, you'll see that what um, what Penicatal are saying is they don't see that most sitting Senate members are looking to their bargaining units to supplant the collegial governance model, and they caution us to to watch that any any movement to enshrine governance matters in the clause in clauses of collective agreements. Um, Lee Penicadel wrote this in 2016, but I would say by this time, if you think back to the work that CAUT has been doing since the mid 70s, um, that CAUT has been effective already in including clauses in the collective agreements that bear upon and affect university governance. So. Um, I've mentioned history. I've talked about the CAT, CAUT role in advancing um, the position of faculty unions within governance. Well, what have we had on the other side? What have what has the sector, the university sector, done? Um, David Cameron describes uh, the AUCC and senior, and university leadership as taking a passive approach. Um, and you'll see from the the quotations there. Um, he doesn't, he doesn't, and I haven't seen that there's been thought leadership from either a governance or management perspective on, on that side. Um, and in the absence of that voice, I think the CAUT voice and the CAUT solution to the, the problem that they perceive has been dominant. David Cameron describes in his book how in the early days of bargaining in the 70s, universities were ill-prepared um, and they, which resulted in situations where, quote, the union team invariably set the agenda with the management team reducing, reduced to the strategy of dam, uh, damage control. And just turning to the quotations that I provided there, um, if we look at, and this is particularly relevant to where we're going with this webinar today, the AUCC developed a model clause on financial exigency back then but it was rejected by the AUCC board as being too extreme. And Cameron says that this incident illustrates the profound ambival ambivalence characterized um, not only of the AUCC, but of also many university administrators toward faculty unionization. He goes on to say that they were nonetheless part of the same academic community and in sympathy with the ideal of faculty self-government and participatory management. Um, so today, I, Canada's universities receive support through Faculty Bargaining Services, which is an organization within the purview of the Canadian Association of University Business Officers. But as history reveals, the CAUT has been successfully developing policy and supporting its members for decades. I think as universities recommit to better governance, it's time for them to develop a, a solution to the problem that CAUT has been trying to solve alone. How do we ensure the health of our, bi our bicameral governance? How do we ensure that senates are robust? And how do we ensure that there's a strong faculty voice on those senates? And the last area I wanna talk about in talking about why we haven't reached alignment on this dual symbiotic dual track approach is what we've done in governance. And this slide is basically my opinion. Um, my observation is I don't, I think oversight of good and effective governance is newer and still developing. Um, and what I mean by that is I think that university boards are newly coming to grips with their responsibility for the effectiveness of the whole governance system and, and what they can do to ensure, for example, that senates are robust and that there's a strong faculty voice. I think that um, there's been an insufficient connection between university labor relations and governance, both staff and just leadership and issues. I think we've seen insufficient attention paid to the effectiveness of university governance at individual universities. 
Um, I question our processes for presenting bargaining mandates and collective agreements to boards and our, our ability to truly assess the associated risks of those uh, mandates and collective agreement and the collective agreement language to university governance. Um, do board members have sufficient knowledge and understanding to ask the right questions about collective agreements and their impact on governance? Um, and I also think that we've probably avoided reputational risk associated with, with striking and have chosen erosions in governance as being more acceptable than strikes. So we've taken some short-term gain for some long-term pain. Um, so what are university, sorry, <laughs> what are university boards to make of all of this? Um, and so, what I'm tackling here is are a couple of questions about the board's role in the approval of bargaining mandates, parameters, and collective agreements, and then the board's role in, in uh, labor relations generally. And what I'd say is that the academic staff collective agreement would be a significant or material contract for all universities, and as such, it would be appropriate that the board should approve it. To me, in terms of good process, it makes sense that the approval of the bargaining mandate would be delegated to a committee of the board, and I think that's often the case, um, and it's usually a, a committee with responsibility for human resources. That committee should be made up of independent or external members to avoid conflicts of interest. That same committee would be charged with recommending the final agreement terms to the board for approval. And I know that in some cases, committees have the mandate just to approve, um, just to approve the collective agreement. And what I'd say to boards there is that may be a fine arrangement, but remember that you're still ultimately responsible for, um, for overseeing collective uh, bargaining and uh, university academic labor relations. Um, neither the committee or the board should be involved in directly in bargaining. Um, although both can and should receive updates as to the tone of bargaining, inclu bargaining, including the possibility of strike and should be assured that strike and contingency planning is in place with respect to the bargaining process. The second process is, is our point is one I think we may think of less. And I think that the board is responsible for the system of university governance and the effectiveness of it, as I just said. And I think to the extent that collective agreements affect the governance system, the board should be apprised of the effects and the risk of those effects. And as I've said earlier, I don't think we've paid sufficient attention to that. So now just turning to the points on the slide, um, when the board is, is uh, implementing or uh, following out uh, its responsibility for overseeing uh, and approving collective agreements, I think that they are well advised to bring an effective governance lens to faculty collective agreements. Um, one piece of advice, and I'm going to talk about this a little bit more, I'm going to keep an eye on the time, but is avo avoiding undue constraints on the board's ability to exercise fiduciary duty. And, and I'm going to talk about employment uh, protection clauses. But in addition to employment protection clauses, I think boards have to be aware of other provisions in your collective agreements, like provisions relating to board members, rights relating to governing bodies, so notice, participation, appointment processes. Uh, bargaining unit scope and definition as it pertains to board members, collegiality and collegial processes and academic freedom. I'll talk about those quickly um, again later. But boards really should be asking about questions about the governance implications of correct collective agreement language. And then what is the role of the board um, in labor relations generally? I think the board has responsibility for ensuring a positive workplace culture. It has responsibility for ensuring that it considers the interests of all stakeholders. Um, including faculty unions, including faculty, and in managing those relationships. And, um, and as I've said earlier, it, it should understand and act on its responsibility for the effectiveness of the governance system. So I want to, one of the points I made earlier is that in overseeing collective bargaining, boy, boards should avoid constraining their ability to fulfill their fiduciary obligations. And I want to thank Alex Usher for his 2015 paper, Beyond Tenure Faculty Employment Protection at, at Canadian Universities. He describes that as a paper about the degree of flexibility institutions have to reallocate or eliminate academic positions in the face of an increasingly challenging financial situation. He wrote this in 2015. Um, his team looked at 55 institutions, and he concludes that, and a thing that we, I think most of us know, is that when it comes to um, restructuring or financial, responding to financial changes, institutions have uh, very little flexibility. 
his paper deals with these uh, six types of employment protective protection clauses that we find in collect, uh, collective agreements with faculty. So there are faculty agreements that have no layoff clauses and they're diff differing language in those. There are agreements that allow redeployment only. There are uh, agreements and 73% of the 55 institutions he looked at had financial exigency clauses that I'll go into in a bit more detail later. Um, there are redundancy clauses that govern when when faculty positions can be declared redundant. There are layoff clauses that allow layoffs, but, but constrain or describe situations in which layoffs can happen. And then there are minimum comp complement clauses, which in which effectively the university is agreeing to uh, employ a minimum number of, of faculty uh, members. So on this slide, I've reproduced uh, uh, Alex Usher's conclusions about these uh, employment protection provisions in collective agreements. And what he essentially finds is that the job protection clauses in faculty uh, collective agreements are vastly stronger than their pub for their public sector peers in the K-12 education or in scientific research. He picked two sort of comparable sectors. And he says, not only do they contain many more um, conditions that must be satisfied just to justify layoffs, but they also provide for vastly higher notice and severance uh, to employees who are being laid off. And then he goes on to say that collectively, the exigency, redundancy, and no layoff clauses in faculty contracts convey an aura of university faculty exceptionalism, whereby Canadian tenured faculty enjoy unparalleled protections from the impacts um, from impacts from the material conditions of their employers. He describes them as um, they're not in place to protect academic freedom because they're on top of tenure, and he describes them as pure protectionism. And What's interesting is that when he wrote this, um, he noted that he thought the whole paper might be moot because universities, quote, never declare financial exigency because the language around exigency and redundancy has been written in such a way that these processes are time consuming and will generate very few savings. And I, as you know, and I, clearly I'm referring to the Laurentian University situation now, clearly neither he nor anyone else contemplated at the time that should a university face severe financial constraints, it might be forced to take another path or feel forced to take another path. So what do um, financial exigency clauses look like? Uh, in my recent blog, I examined the Laurentian University financial exigency clause with the benefit of Alex Usher's paper as he looks at, at 52 universities and he gives us some general characteristics. And so what he tells us is that 92% of them dictate the circumstances in which an institution must find itself in order to con uh, consider declaring a financial exigency, um, that, that these generally correspond to a financial crisis that is projected to continue that must affect the entire institution. He notes two thirds of the clauses require the financial crisis to be a threat to the university's long term viability or its academic mission. So high threshold for financial exigency. He notes that faculty layoffs are the last resort and that 87% of the collective agreements he looked at list alternate steps, require an employer to take alternate steps to increasing revenue, like raising tuition, seeking additional provincial funding, or borrowing money, or to reducing expenses, i.e. laying off employees in other bargaining units or selling assets. And they have to do all that before laying off faculty. And in most cases, 62%, the alternatives have to be exhausted to the greatest reasonable extent. And then one of the other common clauses is the requirement to establish a financial con commission to determine whether or not there's a financial exigency. And in some cases that that commission is established um, of a, or comprised of a majority of faculty and the, the commission's decision as to whether an ex ex sorry, exigency exists is binding at 18 universities. So, um, what are the implications of um, employment protection clauses for boards? And I think this question takes on um, greater urgency in, in the context of the Laurentian situation, but I'd ask you to think about this question because this is, I believe the situation that, um, and I, I don't wanna oversimplify Laurentian, but at the end of the day, I think the situation that the university board, Laurentian University Board found itself in was, it was asking this question. When faced with a situation in which the university is in serious financial circumstances, 
such that faculty layoffs are its only option. But a financial exigency clause or a no layoff clause or a series of employment protection clauses significantly inhibit or prevent their ability to, rest to restructure. How does a board fulfill its fiduciary duty to the university? And does this mean that other institutions, if they're facing a sudden financial crisis and they have exigency clauses like this, does it mean that in order for a board to fulfill its fiduciary duty, it might have to resort to CCAA protection? So one of the things I think we should be asking our boards is, and our labor relations folks and our, and our governance folks is, have you analyzed your collective agreement language so that you understand how it constrains board action and how it might conflict with fiduciary obligations in the event of a financial crisis? Um, I'm going to skip over this next slide. It's from my blog. You can read my blog, but it's, it gives you a series of other questions I think that, that you should be asking. And um, now I'm going to go very quickly through other provisions I think that boards should be paying attention to with this governance lens. So asking themselves, how do these clauses affect our university governance system inside a university? So Obvious one is bargaining unit scope and definition. Are faculty board members excluded from the bargain unit? If they're included, are there restrictions? And I've given you examples of a couple of clauses in which, um, which either board members are excluded during their term on a board or in which uh, there are restrictions on their participation in union um, matters while they're on the board. And Basically, what I'd say is these clauses are examples that that reduce the potential for conflict of interest while faculty members sit on boards. I think they send a signal to the, both the faculty member and the board that the faculty member will be acting on the board, bringing the perspective of faculty members, but acting as a fiduciary like all other board members and making decisions in the best interests of the institution. With respect to academic freedom, I'm not going to say a lot about it, but I think um, the board boards, it's the role of board and Senate to protect ac academic freedom as it underpins the role of universities as democratic institutions. Um, and what I will say is I think there's a lot of confusion about academic freedom. There, the scope of academic freedom at any institution is as described within your collective agreement. And so understanding what it means and being clear about that, I think is very important. Um, I've just included a definition here from Michael Link as to the four components of academic freedom. Um, and just note that it, it doesn't, although it's been alleged, um, there's been an arbitral decision that says that academic freedom includes the right to participate in collegial governance. Uh, there have been some articles written to that effect, um, but it doesn't. And the answer really is contained in your collective agreement. Uh, it can only, it can only, academic freedom can only include rights to collegial participation if that's specified in your collective agreement. Um, this is another clause that I've pulled out from uh, another collective agreement. I just randomly looked at collective agreements, but um, this, in this one, the role of the association is specified. And for those of you who understand labor relations law, um, the four, the four square corners of the collective agreement dictate the rights um, of the faculty association of, of the union and its members and clauses like this. Um, I don't they're difficult to understand, but what they purport to do is extend the role of the of the association beyond the four uh, the corners of the collective agreement. Um, with respect to collegiality, I would just say it's something to be aware of. Uh, collegial um, processes have a real meaning, as Austin and Jones say here, it's the bedrock. If you're committing to collegial process or collegiality in any aspect of your collective agreement, you're committing to um, a, a set of processes that revolve around conferring, collaborating, and gaining uh, consensus and to a, tip, a, a way of making decisions. And so collegiality doesn't have that sort of normal meaning of, you know, collegial will get along. It really does have a meaning. Um, and, and so you should be very clear about what you're committing to. Uh, service provisions, similarly, do they create a right to participate in collegial governance? This, this provision is taken from um, my uh, Ontario Tech, my former employer's collective agreement. And you'll see that 
at the beginning, it says faculty members have a right and responsibility to engage in um, activities and then service includes the contribution to the governance of the university through active and engaged participation on its collegial and administrative bodies. Um, so before I finish up, I do want to talk about the relevance of the Laurentian University financial uh, crisis. We'll be talking about this situation for years. I think there were many failures of governance. I say in my blog that I don't um, I don't endorse many of the things that happened. I think they were um, that there were some serious failures with some very harsh effects on on university stakeholders. But for the purposes of today, I'm I'm spending a bit more time on the topic of what weak labor relations and the existence of a rigid or um, you know, very strong uh, financial exigency clause played in Laurentian University's decision to file under the CCAA. In the blog, I look at what the Auditor General of Ontario said about labor relations and financial exigency in her report on Laurentian. I also look at the letter written by Dr. Robert Hache to the Ontario government, and I look at what he had to say about the role of labor relations, the, the collective agreement and Laurentian's decision to pursue restructuring under the Protection of the Company's Creditors Arrangement Act. And just to remind folks, what that means is when you pursue, um, when you file under the CCAA, you effectively suspend legal rights against the institution, including the suspension of grievances and the collective agreement while you restructure, um, while the university restructures it, its affairs and makes arrangements with its creditors so it can continue as a going concern when it emerges from CCAA protection. So having looked at all this, what can we take away? So we know that um, the Auditor General tells us anyway that Laurentian University didn't have to declare insolvency, but it paid back a credit line. And without access to that credit line, it became insolvent, meaning that it didn't have the means to pay its debts or meet its financial obligations. We know that being able to demonstrate insolvency meant that L Laurentian University had access to the CCAA process. In his letter to the Ontario government, Dr. Hache confirmed that Going into this process, the university had developed a restructuring plan. That restructuring plan would involve extensive layoffs to academic staff. And he confirmed that the decision to follow the CCAA process was in part because it allowed the university to avoid the financial exigency clause. He also says that um, it avoids uh, the university having to disclose some uh, unacceptable financial practices, which of course did not end up being true. But, um, and then he also, pardon me, notes that it allowed the university to avoid the severance costs payable to the faculty in the event of the termination for employment. The Auditor General recognizes that Laurentian and its faculty association had terrible labor relations, they had 97 unresolved grievances, and the Auditor General censored Laurentian for not working with its union and for not using the financial exigency clauses in the collective agreement to find a solution for its crisis. But the question I raised in the blog and I'm raising here again today is how would these two parties have done this? If you're accepting that there are terrible labor relations and the financial exigency clause could not have offered the level of restructuring that Laurentian needed in order to be able to respond to the crisis that it, now I understand that Laurentian was responsible. It managed its, its way into that crisis. It was responsible for creating it. But at the end of the day, the decision for the board is where, where the board is at at the time, being faced with that financial crisis and being um, and having to fulfill its fiduciary duty. Um, so what we know is that working with the union and following the financial exigency clause wouldn't have allowed Laurentian to restructure as it felt it needed to. So I'd ask you to consider this. Do we want our faculty collective agreements to tie the hands of universities and constrain um, board members in the exercise of their fiduciary duty when financial crises hit? And if so, I think we're taking the risk that other universities, if they have a serious financial crisis, will follow a CCA process, perceiving that there's no other way out. What I'd like is to ask whether we can see this as a wake-up call to rethink the effects of, of faculty collective agreements on university governance, to recommit to strong senates, 
to recommit to ensuring a meaningful and robust place for the voice of faculty and university governance to ensuring good faculty relations. And what I'd ask for faculty unions is, you know, I know there, I think that the tendency, and I've, there is some evidence of this, that there, there will be a tendency to become even more protective after Laurentian. But I really do need, I think we need to all all of the governance players, all of the, 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 the parties to this need to ask ourselves whether this is an opportunity to think about how we partner when universities are facing financial crisis. I'm going to leave you with, uh, before we go to questions, I'm going to leave you with a couple of quotations from Alex Usher. Um, his latest blog, his last blog of 2022, he said the biggest issue over the next couple of years is going to be how universities run more leanly. He's foreseeing that we are going to be facing financial challenges as a sector. And he's saying, but at the smarter institutions, this is going to be accompanied by deep thinking about governance. And I fully agree with this. And he says, and not before time. And the other thing he asserts is that it should be possible to balance job protection for academics with institutions' ability to maintain viability and to optimally pursue their missions, even if financial conditions become challenging. So what was I trying to accomplish today? I was trying to demonstrate that there's currently a strong, but I don't think healthy connection between um, faculty labor relations and university governance. I wanted to illustrate the scope of that connection and the potential effects, share my perspective on what Laurentian, uh, the Laurentian University situation could teach us, um, encourage universities to make this connection between the governance, between governance and labor relations and, and really understand the governance implications of collective agreement language, commit to strengthening senates and to ensuring that faculty voice in governance because that has been the driver for a lot of this, this confusion, I think, and this, um, this polarization and the, the resulting imbalance that we see in labor relations. And then I want to encourage universities and faculty unions to consider a different path forward when it comes to jointly supporting university governance and in particular the management of financial crises. Those are my resources and then I'm happy to take uh, to take any questions. Okay, we do have a question. Do you have any practical suggestions on how to strengthen senates and the faculty voice in governance? I do. <laughs> I do. I mean, I think that, um, and you know, I've done some work with uh, this year, um, both alone and with uh, with others who are working in governance. Um, and I, I think that what we can see when we um, when we engage with senates is that there's there's an opportunity for senates to um, adopt some practices to reflect on their own governance and be committed to their own governance. Um, I think that what we see in senates is a focus on operations. Um, and my message to to uh, sorry, and what I should say about the focus on operations is what you often hear from from senate from faculty members is that you know senate's tedious. Senate senate spends a lot of time on things that don't matter. Um, that it's not focusing and the, the Pennock uh, studies found that Senate members felt like that they weren't focusing on the work that they should be focusing on. If you think about some of the big challenges that universities are facing, um, restructuring Senate agendas so that they're spending more time on strategic issues that will really engage faculty and ensure that faculty feel um, feel consulted on some of the on this on the strategic direction. Um, so I think changing the dialogue, changing the agendas. I think that going back to my suggestion earlier, just just the idea that um, that boards start to think about their role in in helping senates become more effective, um, I think is is a path forward. I think strengthening the relationship between the board and the senate is another, and um, I'd say. One of the things that was that uh, I worked on this year with Julia Eastman was a governance review for Dalhousie University. And if you have it, it's a public review and it's available. If you have a chance to look at that, you can see that we've made a number of recommendations as to as to how we how that Senate can be enlivened and how you can change the dialogue and 
increase the strategic focus of that governing body. Thanks, Cheryl. We have another question. Is reconciling appropriate governance arrangements with unions feasible in light of their eagerness to protect faculty to the exclusion of other employees and university priorities? Um, I guess the answer is I hope so. I mean, I, I, you know, I think, you know, if you look at Julia Eastman's book, she, she, on the, on this issue, she would say it's, it's hard to roll back the clock. We've got these very um, protective provisions and collective agreements. Alex Usher is equally pessimistic. And I think that's part of the reason why this conversation is timely. I think that, um, if you look at the Laurentian University situation from the perspective that I've, I've, I'm, that I'm sharing with you, um, I think that it is a real opportunity to ask ourselves if there's such an imbalance in those, in in the collective, in these protective provisions, that it forces, that it's one of the factors that forces a university to consider such extreme action, um, such as the CCAA filing. Don't we have to rethink that? And if you if you think about what um, what we're hearing from folks like Alex Usher, who is saying we have some significant financial challenges ahead of us as universities, um, do we want to be forced? Do we want our boards to be forced into that situation? Um, so, I think Laurentian presents us with an opportunity to rethink it. Of course, it's all about bargaining. It's all about the two parties agreeing um, to take a different approach. Am I optimistic? Uh, I don't know. I'm, you know, I'm hopeful. I don't know if I'm optimistic. And we have another question. Is the new CAUTOCUFA model language being tabled in the sector re-university governance post-COVID? I don't know the answer to that. I don't know if anyone on the chat does. I know, for example, um, that uh, the Queen's University Faculty Association has tabled language that suggests that that either the union or the um, or the university can trigger the financial exigency clause. Um, but I haven't I haven't studied what else is being tabled across the country. And I do see the other question, Kathleen. So it is that um, Laurentian University offers an extreme example. However, does the union not have to accept it helped create the situation through salary drives and seeking to control governance? I think, um, I mean, these are all great questions. I think that's a great question. I think, I'd say two things. I think we all, I think the sector has to take responsibility. I think when we look at Laurentian and you see the history associated with how we got to, um, to collective, uh, the, the collective agreement provisions that we we now have. Um, you'll see David Cameron talks about the fact that CAUT's from the very beginning, CAUT was focused on job protection. So a lot of these clauses have existed for a very long time. The university, as I said, hasn't had thought leadership, hasn't, hasn't come together to say, what's a different vision for this? Um, what's it, how do we want to frame this challenge? Um, so I'd say, uh, yes, unions have to take responsibility. I think the whole sector has to take responsibility. I think there's a question. I think at Laurentian, Laurentian asserted that part of the reason that it was in, in uh, financial difficulty was faculty salaries. I think the Auditor General said she found sac faculty salaries to be comparable. And then you have an article from Alex Usher saying, well, actually, there are more things to think about. And, and, um, and so, you know, I don't think it's a straightforward, simple issue. And I'd say that we all have, we all being everyone in the sector had a role to play in, in um, some of the foundation that built up to where Laurentian found itself. Cheryl, can I, you see the question? I can. So do you think it's realistic to negotiate changes to a financial exigency clause so that it can be triggered when the university's financial state is challenging, but perhaps not to a crisis? Um, well, I'd encourage you to read Alex Usher's paper. I think it's really interesting, and it's in my uh, it's at the in the resources at the end of my um, presentation. Um, is it realistic? What I would like to see is I would like to see um, 
faculty unions and universities sit down and talk about their interests, what they're trying to achieve. Faculty unions are interested in achieving protections for their faculty. That's appropriate. That's what unions do. How far does that, should that protection go? What do universities really need? I don't know that universities have ever actually sat at the table and said, and I don't know because I haven't been there, but you know, given the results that we have, have, have we ever sat at the table and said, let's work through this financial exigency clause and how it would play out. Now we have an example with Laurentian as to how it would play out. And we know that it would not have provided a solution. And in fact, it provided a negative incentive to go in a direction that no one anticipated. So in the context of that, let's have another discussion about how this could really, really work. Um, so again, hopeful, realistic, I'm not sure. Uh, we would all like to be hopeful. Yeah, it is rhetorical. I, I don't know. I, you know, I, I mean, as I said, I've always, uh, and I haven't looked at the attendee list. I, I hope that some of my formal, former uh, union counterparts are on this webinar. And I think that they would agree when I say that I think it's, it's a function of having a very real dialogue. Um, I hope that individual faculty associations would come to the table with the understanding that there are implications for their universities, understanding that we're at a particularly difficult time in our history and that we do need to rethink solutions. Okay, I don't see any more questions, Kathleen, do you? No, I'm just, any further questions? Okay, well, I guess that brings us to a close. It's just after one o'clock. Uh, thank you, Cheryl, very much for a very engaging presentation. I just also like to note at this point that CHURG anticipates it will be offering its first micro certificate in late February. Of course, subject to final Senate approval, it's at Senate Executive today, but we're cautiously optimistic. It's a 36 hour contact, uh, hour contact program consisting of three short courses, it's governance in Canadian universities, and it's going to be offered remotely. We expect that we'll start at the very end of February and run through till May. Um, it's the sole such program in Canada, and I think much of what we spoke about today indicates the need for a, a good understanding of governance, um, some formalized training for governance professionals. We have wonderful governance professionals, but we have other people that are interested in moving into that field. So how do we support them? Um, offered remotely, it's not going to just be you sitting at one end of the computer. We're going to have highly interactive synchronous sessions um, complemented by self-directed work. And it will be led by Sharon Foy, but along with a, scene, a group of senior Canadian university governance professionals, and they will be working in various roles with the participants um, in, as they will be presenters, but they'll also be working in a mentor relationship. I think it will provide a unique opportunity for university governance professionals to learn together, but also to network and sometimes to be able to develop a network that you can pass on um, and draw upon in the future. So we're very hopeful. So please watch for the, we hope the announcement in early January that we're ready to launch. So I just wanted to alert people to that and we're quite excited about that. It's been taken a fair bit of time in the preparation as it does, you know, we do have governance, we do have different committees and we've gone through those. And as we reach the end, we're very hopeful. So thank you again, Cheryl, and um, I wish everybody a very happy holiday season. We will be offering some webinars in January and uh, late January through March. Again, we're trying to look at some very current topics, and I think shortly those will be up on the web. And again, they're uh, complimentary webinars, but we just ask that you register. So I hope that everyone can go watch the most exciting soccer game when the first African nations <laughs> get into, they get into the semifinals. So I hope that I didn't deter you too long for those soccer fans. So good holidays all, and thanks so much for your time. Thanks everybody, bye. Thank you.